everybody. My name is Maura Keefe. I am one of the scholars and residents here at Jacob's Pillow. And it is uh, my delight to be back in the space with all of these gorgeous folks. <laughs> so first off, I'm just going to ask the dancers to introduce themselves and uh, maybe say your hometown. We'll start with you. Hi, my name is Delphi Marentes. I'm born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> Hello, my name is Bianca Medina. I'm born and raised in Chi-Town. Yeah. Hey, y'all, I'm Jasmine Stanley, and I'm from Wake Forest, North Carolina. <laughs> hi, hi, my name is Ana Maria Alvarez, and I, am, I was born in North Carolina. Um, families all over the East Coast, but have been in Los Angeles for the last 19 years. So. <laughs> Hola everyone, my name is Maximiliano Rusmendi. I was born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia, and now I live in San Francisco. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Janet Galdames. I'm from Los Angeles, California. <laughs> Hello, my name is Ruby Morales. I was born in Chicago, but I was raised in Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's up everybody, my name is Charlie Dando, uh, born and raised in Denver, Colorado. Ooh, Ana Maria is the uh, founder of the company, so I'm just going to ask you to start off first uh, because you've, you've set up the space for us. I mean, the gods provided us with this uh, beautiful backdrop, but, but you added to it. Um, could you say something about the altars and the tapestries and why you decided to bring them um, to the outside with you? Yeah, so, so I will, I know we mentioned Emily Orling, who also happens to be my sister-in-law. Um, so uh, Contra el Tiempo has always been kind of a fa uh, familia. You know, we really are in relationship to one another, not just as professionals working together, but very much as a community, as a family. So bringing in family is always an incredible opportunity. Um, she and I worked on this idea of, of how, how visually we could represent the layers of joy and the layers of resilience building and art practice and um, quilting is something that obviously is very is very much comes in you know cross cultural sort of representations of telling stories through materials sewn together and um, so the idea of creating these beautiful altar quilts um, was the way of of creating that space that felt layered felt compl complicated felt. Um, uh, bringing in lots of different sort of energies and, and uh, stories and experiences. And then the altars themselves, um, Bianca Medina, I know, was, was one of the artists that w really came in with this idea of like, how do, we, how do we create sacred space inside of the space? And so, um, you know, many, we all practice different religious, spiritual practices, all of us individually, but, they're, but bringing this idea that, you know, the altar is a, is a, a practice that, that is cross-cultural, is cross-generational, um, is cross-geographic uh, in terms of you can go to lots of different places in the world and this practice of putting sacred objects into space to bring people's memories, to bring people's experiences, to tell stories, to remember the energies of your past and your present and to create the future felt really you know, compelling. And so this altar that you're seeing is actually the first time we've done it in this way where we brought it to, towards the audience. Normally our altar is also with human beings. We have human beings on stage with us, um, but obviously COVID you know, <laughs> changed that. So, so now we wanted to create in this space the idea of like the altar is all around us and that we are all inside of the altar together. So. Bianca, do you want to add anything to that about what you were thinking of or, or how you introduced the idea or, and, or maybe even how it resonates as you're performing? Um, yes, yes. So I think w in our pro in our creative process, we started to brainstorm on text, and that's when the Thanksgiving and dress kind of came into play, calling on all four elements in various ways, and how it kind of it, it, they manifest in our lives it, when we're outdoors and when we're not, and how we're just always coexisting inside of the elements, and how we can find we can access them in various ways if we set intention. And so a big part of that was okay, let's. What is everybody's spiritual practice? Where are we? What is spirituality to all of us if we're going to be, sh you know, talking about this in the work? And, and then how do we embody this element of spirit in the work as well? And so we started, um, there's, you know, the, the work is much longer than this as well. There's so many elements to the work and finding different ways to embody spirit and how that, that can look like so many ways, whether it's calling on a specific tradition and culture, whether it's calling on our own, our own personal, you know, connection to something greater. And then the altar really symbolizing um, 
the physical element of, of sacred space. And so we started collecting things everywhere we went on tour from our communities. As we toured, we started adding um, those, those sacred symbols to the altar. So then we ended up at the end of tour having this altar with bits and pieces from the communities we've been able to come into contact with and create and be in creative spiritual space together. Um, and then inside of the work, you know, the altar is always usually behind us. Um, and so now in this space, it's been beautiful to have nature as this grand <laughs> altar. And then also having, calling on all of that energy into these two altars um, has been really powerful and finding ways. I feel like every show we've been able to find ways to connect to the altar based on what we've just been talking and, mo and dancing about as a collective on stage. So, so yeah, Thank it's you. always there. Thank <laughs> you. I, Jeanette, I was wondering if you uh, could start off by talking a little bit about um, how the, uh, the, the workshop, the choreographic workshops in the community in, in Los Angeles and, yeah. and how, the, how the piece got built. Well, the choreographic labs actually started before the creation of Joyous Justice uh, with our last evening network, and correct me if I'm wrong, Agua Furiosa. Um, and that was really one of my first uh, creative process that I was a part of from the very beginning. So we, for that project specifically, again, talking about the elements, but we were going around different communities in Los Angeles and connecting uh, with people and being, coming into spaces where we were dancing together, we were storytelling, sitting in these circles, um, we call council circle, right, which is a practice as, that was shared with Contratiempo that, through the Ojai Foundation. Um, and it's really a practice of sitting in a circle and um, telling stories, right? We can ask a simple question as, uh, tell me a story about water, right? And that can mean so many different things to all of us. And being in a space where we're listening from the heart, you know, being lean with our stories and reminiscing and sitting in a space of true, genuine listening and having those stories reflect back as we start moving, right, and physicalizing and engaging with one another through movement. And um, that is reflected in the choreographic process. So it's going beyond the studio, right, coming into the studio from 9 to 5 and, and creating um, choreographic work, but really bringing in these stories of the communities into the space. So these choreographic labs live at the, at the heart of the piece. Um, specifically, Joyous Justice, we're focusing on the South LA community. Um, community Coalition is an organization based in South LA that we work closely with and that we continue to be in communication. And as, the, as we come back from the pandemic, are reconnecting, right, and reestablishing what that relationship is. But um, continuing those conversations with community is important to us. And as we travel with the piece, right, it's not just about coming on stage and performing, but also uh, creating moments where we can continue to have these choreographic labs be a part of everywhere we go and have the communities in these different cities that we visit be a part of the piece. Um, for example, I know we didn't get to do this here, but we would hold like a two or three hour choreographic lab that then would lead that group of people who participated, that group or that community who participated then would come on stage with us and perform with us and be a part of the piece. Uh, so they get to move in the space, they get to be a part of moving with us, moving with the audience. Um, that choreographic lab also involves a sabor session. Right? Um, we kind of had a little bit of that with Delphi yesterday through a workshop, but really it's about being in celebration with one another, um, engaging with our bodies, right, with spirit and with one another and just bringing in that, that thing that brings us joy mm -hmm. um, and having that be what inspires the work. So mm -hmm. Anna Maria, I'm wondering if you could um, say something about why stories are so important. I mean, we often think about uh, dancing as being meaning making purely through the body, but here you have really explicit text um, performed po beautifully by the dancers as poets and actors. And wh why, why is the uh, specificity of spoken language uh, a critical part of your work? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think from the very beginning, uh, Contratiempo and this work has been about really remembering, and I mean re reconfiguring the ways that we think of narrative inside of our 
inside of how we fit inside of the narrative, but also narratives that are gonna then give us our future and impact the way that our children grow up with the legacy of who we are and what our world looks like. Um, so that, that idea of story, both storytelling and understanding and reckoning with our past, but also storytelling as a way to generate and conjure futuring. I think man, in many ways this piece conjured <laughs> a future that we're living in right now, even though when you watch this piece, it feels like so much of it feels so relevant. In 2018, we were imagining a lot of this piece as like thinking about a world. What would a world be where people felt this deep connection with one another? And after this pandemic, I think people feel a connection with one another like never before. And so, um, so I think the, the storytelling element has always been fundamental in, in the idea of like we are activists by re-narrating futures um, and that we are the storytellers of the future and I mean cultural makers art makers are that is what we do right that we make sense of the world around us through storytelling um, and I just I do want to say through this piece like the choreographic labs when we would tell ask people to, to tell us stories about joy um, the thing that came up over and over and over again first of all everybody always wanted to tell about their family that was like the stories that kept coming up or people about people's families and who do you think they talked about in their family more than anybody? Like, can, can anybody just yell out? Mother. Mothers, yes, mothers, <laughs> always. Like, it was over and over and over in all of the different labs that we had. It was literally like the stories just kept coming back to mothers. So then what we did, we didn't, we didn't take those stories that people told about their mothers and put it in here, but we said, okay, let's tell stories about our mothers and, and my mothering, you know, you hear a story about my own mothering in there. And, like, and that's the stories then wound up being some of the central themes to the work because our community had told us that the stories about joy are about mothering and, are about, and about family and about mothers. And so that's, so I, I hope that kind of makes sense. It's not about like, we hear a story in the council and then we put it on stage. It's like, oh no, we keep hearing stories about mothering and so now we need to tell our stories about mothering. But that gave us that instruction. Yeah. One of the things, and this is for the uh, performers, um, I'm thinking about uh, you as individuals in a collective. And could you talk about how you feel like, I, I wanna, I want to do what Ruby does, but I also want to be myself, or whatever, and, and how, how, um, how you keep a sense of yourself, even as you're um, in this uh, coalition, and whomever. I think that inside of the work that we're doing constantly, and that we've um, conjured in, in our space, in the Contratiempo space, we, we would meet once a week every, mo every Monday, even though we were not dancing together anymore and even though we were in separate spaces. And our commitment to, um, our commitment to dismantling white supremacy, our commitment to um, community building, um, all of that, through that, it's, is the way that we continuously um, remember, right? We continuously, um, remember like our ancestry, we remember our connection to past, present, and future. And it's through these conversations, through doing the work, through excavating, through crying, through getting angry, but then, you know, finding yourself and your center. Um, it's through doing that work and through the commitment to one another, commitment to ourselves, commitment to community, commitment to this work is the way that we're constantly excavating and finding ourselves and reminding ourselves who we are, um, what we love, uh, what makes us feel good, um, what are the things that we still need to work on um, to be in, in a healthy relationship with one another, to be in reciprocity with each other, with the earth. So it's like inside these conversations, inside of that work, inside of that commitment to one another, you find self, um, right? And so it's, it, it, becomes, it becomes part of, of being normal, of being just self, of being um, is, is, yeah, I think that that's, a, that's the best way to describe, to describe it. It's like an easy finding um, when we're committed to each other. I think it also reflects the future that we want to see. Yeah. Uh, in that as we're dealing with like hegemonic culture of like everyone has to fit into some external standard of normal that we are trying to affirm that we are allowed to be a self and that we are allowed to, to move the way that we are moved. Um, and so it's kind of, it is very intentional that we are, are, we come from very different places, very different dance backgrounds, very different lineages, 
that we, we bring those lineages in because those lineages are us um, and that we are not trying to uh, kind of bend those lineages to make us all fit into a box that we do not fit into, into some sort of normalcy um, that we just could never fit into for each other. And I think that it's, it's somewhat of a, a, a value of futuring what we want to see in the world, a world where anyone can be who they are where they are, how they are, where all expressions of humanity are like welcomed, but also have this beauty to it. Um, so how that's that's the intent you, behind it. You talk about dancestors. Could you d define the term for, for folks? Um, yeah, dancestors. Um, obviously, uh, uh, I am a white presenting male um, who is on this dance company, and I I had a hard time connecting to lineage a lot, um, and my style of dance that it comes from the club. Uh, and so a lot of my, my people who I learned from, they became my ancestors. And so I call them my dancestors. Those are my, my dancers who I, who I embody. And, and we, we uh, practice a lot of traditions um, of ancestor worship. That's a lot of the Afro, Afro Latin, Afro Brazilian traditions are about ancestor worship. So um, my way of connecting to this lineage and tradition was to honor my, my ancestors, who they had ancestors, but I did not, so they became them. Yeah, for, for me, even with that dance idea, growing up in my family, my family's from Haiti, and we listened to like Latin music, hip hop music, everything during those times. So even though we didn't grow up with learning like the basics of salsa and the idea, by hearing the music, we still had our movements and we still had our ideas of grooving and dancing to it even though that was an hour exact pass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jasmine, can, could you say something about the, the word artivist? Artivist. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think it has very much to do with storytelling and how we're embodying those stories. Um, artivist is a, is a term that I learned from a woman whose name is Martha Gonzalez, thank you. I was about to say Martha, not Martha Graham. <laughs> Martha Gonzalez. <laughs> She's an artist, a musician, um, a really powerful writer based in LA. Um, and taking this idea of how we're using our art for activism, how we're able to tell all these stories that people are able to see multiple different stories than what is just the normal. Um, and it helps to undo certain patterns that can be harmful. It helps to um, reimagine what is possible. Um, yeah, and art is super, art has this way of, of um, oh, this makes me feel kind of icky saying, but like it, it helps to um, make complicated or complex or uncomfortable conversations more palatable um, in that you're able to receive it better and you're also able to, to give it better. It's a lot easier to talk about being unapologetically black in like this poetic and movement kind of way, brown, you know, as opposed to just saying like, I'm black y'all. Like, it's, and you know, it's, diff it's different, it's different, right? Um, but yeah, art, yeah, artivist. <laughs> thank you, it's so great to see all of you here and thank you for your beautiful. Thank you so much, y'all. I love the rain. No, stop it. Oh, yeah. Jeanette. Yeah. Girl, but we outdoors. Come on. <laughs>